I realized making contemporary films at the time. A film comes out a year later, sometimes longer than the fashion of the time. And if you really want to do something interesting, it's about the character. What would a character really do? What would they wear? How would they perceive, be perceived? As young as they might be, they still have their own look, their own sensibility about who they are. And that's like the Breakfast Club taught me a great lesson because they were so individual, but he wrote them so, they were so well written. Uh, they were alive on the page, you know, it was that simple. And I did boards, I went back and I did boards before I met them, before I met the, uh, the group. And uh, it was so incredible because John Hughes was very special that way. The writing, he, he really grabbed the young, he was a young person himself. He had that soul and he knew how they felt and he knew what embarrassed them. He knew so many things that you would never even think about. And although I had children of my own, it helped me figure out the develop their development and who they were going to be and how they came to be. So it was wonderful being able to portray, especially the Breakfast Club, which set a standard of different types of kids coming from whatever their backgrounds were, was part of their personality. So that was a great experience for me. And then we went on and did the fantasy aspect and you know, you get into all these. Uh, what I did, though, was I came from New York, and I, when I got Fast Times, which was about California kids, I didn't know about what they were like or what they did or how they looked or how they liked dress. So I would hang out. I went around the high schools, and I started with the Van Nuys High School, and I started carrying a Polaroid at the time was this big. I'm holding this <laughs> Polaroid with film. It, I, you can't even imagine. The film was like a compact itself. And I'm walking around and taking pictures of them coming out of the school, and I'm inching my way toward the school. And I enter the school, the premises, and I see them sitting. There's a group having lunch uh, outdoors. They're cheerleaders. I, I saw the, ath the athletes. The stoners were something else. And each group, they would sit the, together for the lunch, which I never saw. I mean, I never saw kids look like that either. So as I'm walking around, I'm taking these pictures with this humongous camera, and um, the security guard came over and he said, excuse me, uh, they'd like to see you in the office. Would you like to come with me? I thought, okay. And uh, they had called the police already uh, that you were taking pictures and of underage children without the parents' consent and you can't be doing things like that. And I said, but I'm researching for a film. I, I, it, I have to do that. I don't know what these kids are like. You know, they said, I said, call my producers, please call Universal, call the studio. And uh, they had already called the police, but, but it was okay because by the time they got there, they had talked to Art Linson at the time was one of the producers and the studio, Tom Mount, who was one of the studio heads. And, uh, they let me go, but it was such a, it was great though, on one hand, because I got that feeling how different these kids were and how they grew up and lived in this climate. And I realized climate has a lot to do with the look of all of us, I'm, I'm sure of that. So then it went to Chicago <laughs> and I wound up hanging out there. And those were the kids, mostly the Chicago kids were the Ferris Bueller type, with, which were uh, more of the, uh, what should I say, he was intelligent, his parents were very, uh, the mother was a real estate agent, they were very involved in present day things that were going on in life, which 
made their kids a lot more aware in a certain thing, in a certain uh, aspect of who they were and what they look like and the clothing they wore, where they shop. It really, it, it was such a learning experience seeing how uh, these kids from these different backgrounds in different parts of the United States look how they are. And uh, that to me was fantastic. And I carried that through with everything I wound up doing. I realized that this is a lot. I just have to point out something. Sure. So Marilyn takes all of this observation and then she distills this knowledge into each of these individual characters, which on their own have had such an impact on society. So she makes it sound like she's just taking pictures, but there's all of this observation of psyche and then applying it to the scripts that she gets. And so that's, I think, where the magic occurs. Thank and, you, you know, in, in talking about Pretty Woman, woman you know, I want to talk about the transformative power of the costume, especially Julia's costume, yeah. because you start in a certain place and you, she's that woman. And then she's so smart and you make her so smart That's right. and then you make her that woman. And she's totally believable as both. Yeah. How? How? <clears throat> Once again, <laughs> we, uh, the story, the girl, the background talking to Gary Marshall, who wrote an amazing piece because it could have been so tacky and so horrible and embarrassing kind of film. It really could have been that kind of a movie. But because... He wasn't the first director. No, the, I, I was attached to it when it was dark. It, right was, that, yeah. it was a very dark film. I can't remember the director's name. Please forgive me. Because of yes. the director. The, so the producers remained the same. And then the studio, they decided that they're going to do a Disney film. They'll do Touchstone. So they worked that through with the company. And we wound up with this script and a new pretty woman, which was incredible. And it was called 3000 at first because that's the money that she got. That yeah. was the name of the who, original script. Who were the other actors that were in play for the role? Oh, my God. They, Julia, uh, she had to uh, get into bed with at least five different actors, and no one wanted to do the movie. They even went to Sean Connery, and they tried no, no one. And Richard Gere was totally not interested. But, Ju but before Julia, they had... Diane Lane. They had got every young woman at the time uh, was also put on film in her underwear, but it was kind of interesting. And uh, Julia won the part back. She had it in first. They decided they didn't weren't really keen on her. They wanted to see who else, maybe a more rounded actress at the time or something like that. And they wound up with Julia. She won her part again. And after everyone, all the men rejected the role, uh, they went after Richard Gere and she got on a plane, Julia, with Gary and went to New York. Yeah. And they had a meeting with him and they came back and he was signed to the movie. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what it took. I mean, it was really something. So let's talk about that first question. Okay. Let's talk about what um, your influences were and how you made her that woman. That woman. Well, you know, when we're doing a film and we're very close to the female or the male, we have to take into consideration their bodies, and how they handled themselves and what they look best in and what is a better feature of theirs and so on. So with Julia, she has a really good body, but she doesn't have a knocked out body, you know, where you could put one outfit on her and she's just curvy forever and it's perfect. So that's how I came up with the two pieces that uh, the Rudy Gernreich uh, bathing suit my mother had gotten me when I was a young kid <laughs> and he always used metal pieces that was his thing they were much more they were much more artsy than the ones holding the, the outfit together uh, so that's how the you know 
because she wasn't like, didn't have that waist and the curves. I broke it up with the top attached to the bottom, which, cause she has a nice rear end. And we played up what her best attributes with that and then held it up. And then the back was falling down. So I had to put a ring in the back as well. So, you know, it was balanced. But it was a, a great experience, you know, doing that. What about the shoes? Oh, the boots. I was with my husband at the time. Not that I'm married that many times. <laughs> but we were in London, and we're walking up King's Road in Chelsea, and there's a punk store. And I love, I love the punk things. I think they're so imaginative. Unfortunately, if I wore them, it wouldn't be right, but I would if I could, believe me. But um, I saw these boots, these like forever high boots. And they were in the window. It was a shop called Nana's, and it was a punk store. I believe they had a Nana here yeah, in, 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 for a while. Santa yeah, Monica. but it originally was in London. And my husband was uh, from Scotland, but lived in London, and we went visiting, and that's how we wound up just shopping around. And I remembered those boots. I said, Simon, we've got to go in there. We just have to go in and find out about these boots. And uh, we did, and I took all the information, not that I bought them for myself, but they were made, it was something I had to have at some point. And when it came to Pretty Woman, that was it. I called the shop in London, which is like almost a year later, and they got me the boots. And we, we bought the boots from them, they shipped them to us, and that was, that was it. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the thing that I, I love that the Disney execs wanted to make the red dress black. Oh, God. No. It, it, Can you imagine? So this is And Gary, because black is sexy and it shows much more, you know. It's so elegant, black, and so on. But we were doing a progression with the film, you know, and also with her jewelry. I used the same pearl earrings on almost every outfit. She had just a couple of different things. I pared her down from the first time you see her with just everything on, a million chains and earrings and bracelets and you name it, and she had it on. So I, I just went completely opposite. She, she was smart. He was smart. She took on his persona and realized what was cool and what wasn't. And that's what I love about the film generally and the acting because you see how bright she was and how connected and you see how she they, they how they taught each other and how beautiful that was because he was a horrible human being you know and she was just grasping at life and it was a wonderful uh, union it really was and so once again doing a progression undoing her as I was doing her, we had to undo it. So we pulled away all of the, ex, you know, the extra accessories and pared her down. And she was a quick learner and very smart, as you could see in the film. And um, that's, we went from there. I made her every single outfit because, once again, fashion happens that year, but you don't want to copy exactly that because it's going to happen. It'll take maybe two years or more for the film to come out. So you work around that and you try to be as original as you can. And that's why... Well, that red dress is probably one of the most timeless things in cinema. That's I thank you for that, yeah. And also that dress was put together for her body. She has narrow shoulders, so we had to make sure that the uh, there was elastic underneath holding that little poof up on the shoulder, not falling down. And uh, I had three versions of the red dress. They were, the girls were from the Academy have my pictures. Uh, they were supposed to bring them, but I guess they didn't need them. They're not even here, so... Never mind. Uh, <laughs> but it was a progression with the red dress as well. I had it first in the back. She's long-waisted, and it didn't look 
it didn't look right, you know, and also fighting for the color. Oh, my God. She, she sat in front of a camera with every color you can imagine. I should have brought the photographs, honestly. I have photographs of her uh, testing color fabric to make the dress, to make the cocktail dress in the beginning. I had underlying silver, then I had gold under the, the, uh, the lace. Everything was handled for the best possible, not look at me, look at me, but look at her, you know. And I didn't use jewelry except for those little earrings that match the dress. And we used for the black uh, cocktail dress, I cut out all the appliques and we just had it holding up shoulder across to shoulder once again because she's narrow and we wanted her to look you know, a breath in there, and it worked. And then 7th and 7th Avenue downtown, they copied that dress. I think they must have sold 5,000. It was ridiculous. No, really. I, I, I said, what? Let's talk about uh, yeah. Richard's clothes, because uh, Marilyn, um, in all of her work, is incredibly um, detailed about texture. So she brings that eye to everything. So his clothes were very... I had to... Uh, I traveled for his clothes. <laughs> he was the kind of guy... At the time, we're talking about, uh, what, 90? About that time, Tweety for men and, and everything was uh, textured and it, it, nothing was smooth. And his character was totally a smooth kind of character. You know, you're not going to notice a tweet or, you know, you shouldn't notice any of that. It should just be part of who he is. So I went around to all the fabric stores, of course, ISW, uh, Silk, uh, Beverly Silk and Woolens, everything in town. No one had gabagine at the time. It was absolutely crazy. I couldn't. So I called Nino Sharuti. And that's how we got involved with their, his tuxedo was from Nino. And I had to, I went to it, I had to go. No, I did. But Turin, Turin is, isn't one of these, you know, holiday places. But they had the mill there. So I begged. I really, I was on my hands and knees. I said, I have to go uh, because we need this gabardine. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, you need the gabardine. And I said, oh, really? For real? Call these people. Call every fabric store here. Call all the jobbers here. Find out if you could get me that simple fabric for Richard's character. And they find, they let me go. They said, okay, because they couldn't. And believe me, they tried. They did. They really tried. But isn't it so amazing that all this time and you look at it, I'm just, I think it's amazing that you say that you are satisfied with it because usually people are so dissatisfied, but it just shows how well. No, I know the character. Yeah, I mean, because you can't go with I mean, always. I never have thought so when you were making. It. I mean, you're just working so fast and trying to get it done and trying to answer all these questions. and save money and it's a million things. Well, and then it just happens to be a good. Well, it, it it we put a lot of time into the character mm -hmm. to make the clothing right for both of them. Seriously, it was uh, a lot of work. My guy, all of us together my crew, we all worked our asses off on that film to, to, to really project uh, the different, not everything you see on TV, you know, it's it just, we had to make it that all you did was look at those characters and that's what made them, or they made the look for, for who they were, from the written page to the actual actor. And... Uh, that, to me, is the most important thing, and I fight for that. Uh, I mean, I don't go get in the ring, but I try to do, you know, psychology with the powers that be because they have set images, guys especially when it comes to sexy girls, as you know. And, you know, it, it, it's a fight to not have that actual type, type thing going on, you know, uh, there was an, uh, who was it? Legere was making these outfits. They were like bandages on the body. I mean, they love that, the guy. They love that. That is, to them is the best thing ever, you know? 
But, um, but it wasn't the character. No. That's why when I, I would do those boards before, sometimes before we even had the character, the actual, we just adjusted to their bodies. But I would go back and do boards, breaking down the script for character to character and giving the look that I felt they should have that can help the story, that can help the screenplay. It's like from script to screen, you know. And uh, right now, all the boards, I do character boards. They're not, you know, fancy. They're Sometimes it's just a look in the eye. Like I, for Romancing the Stone, I had a picture of just eyes that I used on her board. And uh, it just it is the kind of thing that I feel the art involved of the character from script to screen is very important for me because it tells the story of who they are. So I would do these boards and present them. And uh, before we did the film and see how it all came about and involved everyone, involved all the art departments in everything I did. But at this time, the Academy is putting a book together with me of uh, script to screen characters for my boards for the, for the film as educational type of uh, thing, so, but it, it works, you know, it's something, it takes a lot more, uh, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time, and they're not going to pay for every, you know, hour that you're putting into some of this, because it, but you just do it, you got to, because you've got to show the movie that you think you're reading, that they presented to you, that you're giving them back visually. And that's how I operate. Operate, that sounds. Um, one thing I'd like to touch on before we open it up to questions sure. is one, and something that I've always been fascinated about, is I love your relationship to music. So your wow. personal relationship to music and also your relationship with John, John Hughes and music and how that informed your design. Oh. Because so many things come into costume design that a designer synthesizes and then makes an expression of a person. Yeah. And some of them are just really esoteric. And music is something that's so vital So to vital. My um, husband, the other husband, was uh, in, in the mu music business. <laughs> he, he was in a group. <laughs> so it was like rock and roll, uh, possibly sex and drugs, but it was that period in time. It keeps you numb. It keeps you. <laughs> but um, I was the, always very turned on because that's the area I really came out of. And that's what inspired me to design things because it made me think about various, uh, you know, when you hear, when you hear music, you see pictures. You do, you know, and when it's applied to someone, oh, you have this boyfriend, and suddenly this one song, you can totally relate to this guy. And that's how I always relate to music when the music is done. And John Hughes was a, a, a very special case. He, when we did Pretty in Pink, he would, we would meet at his house, we'd sit around, and we'd go through the script, and he would go, Okay, right now, over here. Now, this is not a warm, personable guy. He's like, you know, very straightforward. But he had a soul that was in, amazing. So he had someone collecting these songs. And he said, okay, in this scene right now, we're going to play this song. And they dropped the song. And we heard the song. And we're going through the script going, oh, my God, that's killer. The music in that film is just outrageous. We never heard of these groups from England. We, you know, Tears for Fears and you know, all of those, uh, you know, the songs were just incredible. Chrissy Hines' husband was in Tears for Fears, but she was pregnant at the time, so she did not want to do the song for uh, The Breakfast Club. And uh, he said, he, she sent him into the studio with his group, and they they sent a recording back, and it was just nothing. It was not good. It wasn't good. And then he had a meeting with the husband and the whole group and Chrissy, because she was pregnant at the time, so she 
couldn't she couldn't see herself in the studio doing that. And uh, what came back was amazing. Was the song that you know now was the theme song of the film. But he would do that in different scenes in all the films that we worked with with him. And I never met anyone who did that before or but, after. But I think the thing I find so interesting is you would take that music oh. and then you would sublimate it and then you would express it in clothing. Yes. That's the, you know, that's the part that I find is incredible. Well, having someone writing the scene the way they did, a lot of times I'm flying, you know, on my own completely. And uh, I just do it by emotion and whatever it is. <laughs> that I have to pull together, I do. But with John Hughes, may he rest in peace, he was so brilliant. He covered all the aspects of the writing of the character, the quirkiness, all of that, a little bit of him was in each of those characters. He was kind of multifaceted personality, he was. And uh, he was very intense about music and that together with his writing, those characters and their their situations, it was perfect. It was just incredible. And me coming out of that industry, loving music, you know, being involved. A match made in heaven. Was, it was, with him especially. So I want to open up to, are there any questions from Connie? God. Connie, yeah. <laughs> no. Um, um, I love hearing you say that little bit that you were saying when you said you're putting together a portfolio to that's going to be a teaching thing. Yes. Because what you said right up to then is the first time in my career that I've been fun when I didn't do film. <laughs> you, the way you explained your process and the depth that you went to through we don't have that in television at all. And, you know, for camera sitcom, we have a day, two days. Well, you're you know? also right here, right now. Yeah. So, um, but it, it just made me choke. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Honestly, and I can't wait for the book. <laughs> so. That's going to be a while. We got to, we, they, they're digitizing. It takes forever to do the boards. And then we have to you know, do the copy and then make the presentation to, to publishers, to, you know, who will publish this book. I think it's an incredible project. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that red dress. <laughs> yeah, the red. Oh, my goodness, that red dress. And you said it was made to her body, which obviously. Yeah. Um, what, what brought you into this drape idea? so perfect because she's very long-waisted and i didn't want she doesn't have that's why all the clothing nothing was like skin tight on her to to shape yeah. her the way uh, you know most yeah. of these sexy girls are so i worked around her body and used that piece i had it in the back at first but I was inspired. I had gone to the Huntington Hartford Museum in New York, and I saw the portrait of Madame X uh, and that black gown. And I know that. that's, that's amazing. That was my inspiration for the for her gown. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just so stunning. I think when you think of the movie, that dress and her life. Oh, she's... Are she, the two things you remember the most? She was too, she was too much, really. Yeah. Thank you. Too much in a good way. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's infectious. I was just wondering who made your new clothes? Who made? Um, I used Mary, uh, Mary Ellen a lot. And uh, I had a wonderful woman. Unfortunately, she passed away. She was running Disney at the workshop there. And I actually worked with her on a mannequin and draped the, the gown first. Yeah, so, with her, and she passed away, and I wanted her to know that what a wonderful experience it was for me and how what a hit that was, and she would have just flown, but unfortunately, yeah, I know, it's so sad. So Mary Ellen helped with that, but it was too corseted. 
Yeah, I couldn't, you know, it wasn't right for Julia to be so strictly in something that she couldn't breathe. Yeah. So I undid that and loosened that up and gave her some breathing room and more relaxed with her, her body. Yeah. And were all of Richard's suits made? Everything, except the tuxedo, as you said. Yeah, everything. And that gray, I just wanted that color to match his hair during the day. Sometimes it looked very blue in the, in the, in the uh, film, but it wasn't. It was really a slate gray. And uh, it, it was important, you know, to have those, those the gabardine, the smooth, because that was his character. He wasn't one of these guys who did the tweed with the, the, the pattern and with this. And his ties, we made the ties too. Yeah. Yeah. Got the fabric. Because uh, once again, you know, I, I went everywhere to try to find ties for a businessman. Where are you going to find that? You know, just there were stripes and there were polka dots and there were the usual. But but, but it looks effortless, doesn't it? It's like you wouldn't even think that all that labor. Oh. <laughs> Is Dan here? No. Oh, he could attest for it. How much time do you have to prep it? Not very much. And not only that, they didn't believe in the movie. It was, they thought it was going to go straight to video. That, uh -huh. that was, yeah, because they just did not believe that this could be, uh, you know, such a hit. It couldn't happen. So they treated it the same way. They put it out, and that's why they gave me that plaque, Jeffrey Kassenberg and the powers that be from, from yeah, that, that's in there because they had ghosts coming in the film, and they wanted Pretty Woman only three weeks in the theater, and then booted it out for Ghost. And they couldn't believe, yeah, and there, there's letters, oh, it says in the back also what it had to do. And their letters to me, which I was shocked. <sighs> okay. On Saturday, August 25th, 1990, Pretty Woman gave the highest grossing release in our 67th year. <gasps> Touchstones? Yeah. It's the Walt Disney Studios. Congratulations. But that, wow. and they did that because they had no, they didn't believe in it. It was crazy. They sent letters. I had got letters from the heads of the studio. We're so happy you did this and blah, blah, blah. But they never would have done that if they believed in the film in the first place. The film just took off on its own. You know, it was appealing to the, the average person. Really? You have another question? Can you talk about when they changed the title and working with Gary Marshall? Oh, working with Gary was something else. He was too much. Hi. <laughs> in a good way? In a good way. And, in, and it was hard because Gary is a comedian. You know, he mostly comedy. And with him, he had, he made, first of all, he wrote this script, which is incredible. And I can't see anyone except Julia doing that doing what he did, just her. And she was so green in the beginning. You know, that was her second film. And uh, she was, she's charming, was just charming. And Gary had a charm about him. But Gary was a seasoned, uh, what if the odd couple, you know, that kind of comedy, the TV with all those shows. He had a certain element of something that not an average screenwriter had. Had he not written all those TV shows and all those, uh, uh, the, the combination of characters that he put together in comedy, would he probably would never have been able to accomplish. He accomplished something so incredible. Richard Gere is so far from a comedian or, or, or you know, he's just a sexy guy. It's a, you know, and he's always been that guy. But he managed the way Gary wrote, because he stopped uh, doing such heavy com comedic situations with them, but sliced it and just did the top, and it was, it was perfect. It was perfect, because Richard Gere could, excuse me, probably could not have uh, delved further into comedy or anything close to that. 
he was got that sexy kind of he would I mean I thought he was just amazing I don't think he got enough credit for uh, his role in uh, Pretty Woman no I think he's pretty sexy I think they both got really acknowledged yeah I think they both got really acknowledged by the public yeah well yeah what about the title change did Gary come up with 3000 and then change it uh, no, it was the darker version of the film at first. I can't remember the director's name. I I, uh, I don't recall seeing him, his name, and other things. I never really, I met him the one time, and the script was so dark. It was, it, she dies, and, and, and she's a heavy prostitute, and it's dark and weird and, you know, lackluster, seriously. Uh, and he took it and he turned it into Pretty Woman, which was extraordinary. He took the sex and he sliced that and made it the attraction. So he wrote with attraction. Everything was an attraction. Even to the part of, uh, what's his name? His partner who goes after, who goes after Julia. Uh, oh. He's ducky. I can't think of that. Yes, Jason. Even to Jason. I mean, he he wrote so beautifully because he had that other stuff in him and he was able, you know, that was the thing about Gary that I admired so much. How he took drama and turned it into humor, but intelligent, you know, humor intelligent way to handle the characters and how their attraction and how they came to be. And the beautiful thing, which was not in the other script, I wish I kept that script uh, because you wouldn't have believed, no one would have believed it, seriously. And I got involved with it because of Stephen Ruther, who was a producer, who was a friend of mine, who asked him to do it. And then when that fell apart with him, he brought me on to do you know, Pretty Woman with Gary. But um, the writing, you know, in the first, it, it was just unbelievably dark. Dark and no hope. None of them had any hope. I don't, couldn't believe they were actually going to make that film because even the hero wasn't a real hero. You know, he saves her for a minute and then he lets her, you know, OD. And doesn't take her out of an ugly world when he could have offered her. So that script, you never would have wanted to see that film. Never. I just want you to tell them about her hat. Oh. Before we go, I just want... The hat. The hat. Okay. We came to the set. She's all dressed. And she has her wig on. And I'm, it's cold, and I have my fisherman's cap on with my coat, my jacket, whatever I'm wearing. And Gary just walked over and took it off my head and put it on her. And that's <laughs> what happened. That's it. So that was his contribution. Yes. I pulled my trade up the section, uh, the upper section in, in Pretty Woman. Did you design it uh, as well? Did, did, yes, we played, we worked with it. We didn't create it. No, that was created because we had no time to do it hardly. So it had to be by the opera company. And uh, we chose the look that they went for the garden, the feeling her, you know, of her, of her dress. And that's basically the feeling is all we were able to give to them because we didn't know exactly when we were going to be able to play that. Also, I noticed that the poster uh, looks different than the actual costumes. Mm -hmm. Did they change, why did they change the colors of the, of the poster? Uh, the not? studio changed it to pink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, for, for the, yeah. To the feeling of the outfit. They wanted it to soften it, I imagine. And it's very attractive. It really is. So. Well, there's oh, yeah. a second question. I want to ask one more question about your your award winning uh, award nominated Oscar nominated work for the Untouchables. So uh, did, can we talk about that just for a little bit? Sure. What do you? What was it like working on that uh, period? The whole period. Well, that was an amazing situation because uh, 
Brian, I had the opportunity and I wanted to go to Italy to make the clothing because I had met with Giorgio Armani on something else and they were when they kept wanting to know what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Because I did 48 hours and I found a suit of his and we made them through his company for Eddie Murphy. So it he, they kept calling me, what are you going to do now? What are you doing? We paid for those suits, by the way, a lot. <laughs> but it was okay because they were very, uh, you know, open and giving to us. So when it came to doing the Untouchables, it was hard to get fabric that was, there's not a lot of clothing left around in the 30s, for the 30s, especially early 30s, coming out of the 20s. Yeah, during the 30s, the fabrics, uh, I mean, there were no clothing. You had to come up with something and either have fabric made or, so we had to make everything. So I went once again, I talked them into uh, working with us, Armani, maybe a big mistake of, at the end of all of it. I wish, Dan, uh, I wish Dan Lester was here to help tell the rest of this boy what we went through on that film. But um, I met with the Armani people. I told them what we were doing. Brian De Palma did not want to meet with them. What he wanted me to do was show him what I wanted to do. So I made a graph, a board, made all the feds, the federal agents, they were in grays, various grays and different textures, and coordinated all of the film, once again, on boards mm -hmm. that, uh, yes, uh, and De Palma, he would never have let me go to Europe without seeing what he was going to be getting, and so I worked diligently with all of us, put together what all the boards of the, the federal agents, the Mounties, the this, the that, all the different things that we had to do. By the way, the Mounties were added on, which is a funny story that I'll tell you about in a second. But anyway, I brought everything to Italy with me that Brian had seen and approved, the fabrications, the colorings, everything. Uh, I did character boards for those too, which you will see at some point in time when that book comes out for all the characters. But um, so I go to Italy. I spent three weeks with the factory, with the foreman, with the head sewers, with the drapers, with the tailors, with you, you name it. And I was there. We made the shirts. I made the shirts there, not from him, from another, from another contact while I was there. The same with hats, they came from Ravel. I made the hats in Milan as well. And Alpo did the gloves, the suede gloves for all the gangsters. But I, I go out of my way only because it's a presentation you want to make, you know, you're an artist. You want to show what your director, what your the, the, the author wants to see. He's, he's showing you in words and you're coming back with the visuals. And that's very important. And color coding is also very important in making groups of people on film. Even though you don't realize you're, you're, you're absorbing that, oh, when you see grays, you realize that they are part of the heads. Now it could be gray, blue gray, it could be gray tweed, it could be gray stripe, but that is all inclusive in that particular area. So that's how I worked. I spent all this time in Italy working through what we were going to do. And I, like I said before, I wish Dan Lester was here. We get, the, we get the clothing back from Italy. And he made a clown clothing for, for Capone. It was like big checks. And we, you can't even believe it. Uh, what, and I made a deal with them to give them front credit with the studio, I fought for this. I said, wardrobe by Armani has to be in the front with me, has to be. We will get the most extraordinary clothing. Yeah, we used it all on extras, it was unbelievable. In Chicago, I wound up with every single tailor from Paramount in Chicago with me, making Sean Connery's coats and things, and you can't even imagine what they did. They, they, 
they could have killed us, I swear. But they, we used all the different machines. We overdyed every single suit, slack, shirt, anything he sent us, we overdyed. It was obnoxious. And uh, we were almost going to get thrown out of the park complex because we used all that machine. We were dying everything ourselves, <laughs> running up the street and down. And Chicago is an interesting place. You could get three seasons in one day, you know, you know really and truly. Uh, so there we were running around like lunatics. Uh, and but we did it. We did it. And we we came through. We got the gabardine, made all those coats for uh, for. Uh, uh, <laughs> God, I'm thinking of so, you know, as I'm talking to you, I'm just thinking of all the work that we did and how crazy it was. So I had to write a log because my production manager was in so much trouble because we overdyed $250,000 worth of clothing. And uh, because it wasn't, it, I, I swear on my life, I mean, I, I was crying every day. And uh, we made it work, though. We made it work. You made it incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. That's a beautiful film. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Primarily, I want to express my admiration for the line of work that you and your peers do. Thank you. Thank you. Great Woman is one of my wife's favorites. Yes. So, I, mean, I saw the post on that. Like, yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. The, the impact that clothing characters have, what you remember and bring with you, it's pretty amazing. And thank you. So Thank you. Thank awesome. you very much. Yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, the characters, if you think back at the customs of each of the characters. Yeah. Very, very well done and perfect for each person in that. Thank you. And also yeah. weird sights. Uh, it came out oh, of, weird at a time where wow. I was growing up. Whoa. Uh, that was, was like, wow. That was, that was a <laughs> that wow. Was cool. Yeah. Those boys <laughs> dressing them her. Oh my God. We had two different hers before her. Oh, wow. <laughs> Rod Stewart's girlfriend at the time was a big model, and she was the the girl that was going to be the it. And uh, she was a model, so she just posed all the time and, and couldn't get her to act. <laughs> and they finally let her go. Yeah, they did. And that's how they got Kelly LeBrock. I was just wondering, did um, Juliet have a body double? Because it seemed like a lot of the times when they were shooting, her face was blocked out, like on the piano scene. No, that's, no, that's her. her. That's her. The the oh, she was upset about the oh. Sorry. She was upset about the poster because they used a body double to do that. She said, that's not my body. She was very upset about that. But not in um, excuse me, not in the course of the film. At all. Oh no! Any of the, yeah, that her bo the body that was the same girl that d did the poster. Yeah, well, you don't see the face at all. Yeah. Okay. Going once. Going twice. Okay. Uh, talk about your process when you were um, doing uh, fast times and how you went to the school and did all that research. I'm sure it changes from piece, you know, from each film that you do. Is there something that like you have such a vivid memory of like getting cops called on you? Oh God, it was horrible. <laughs> but you know, in each state, the school kids are dressed differently. They they're not all the same characters that you you think you know. Out here, you had your stoners. You had all you know the the those the vans and the, relaxed. Yeah, very very cool. Like you know be all smoking marijuana and carrying on and wearing the surfer look. You know, they all wore that. I loved doing that, too, because I didn't know from that. I come from Brooklyn, New York, and the kids there are way different, and Chicago is way different. So you have to research all these areas and the types of kids that they are, what they, you know, the kind of school they go to, who would live in that neighborhood, what are they, you know. It, you, for me, everything is about character development, and through that, uh, <clears throat> you could dress anyone knowing what their, 
what they're coming from, basically, and what their interests are. But I just have to add, yeah. it's a testament to how carefully she observes that each of those different places rings true, because otherwise it wouldn't last as long as it did. It would just <laughs> fall away into the you know, detritus, but it sticks with you because it's so authentic. That's you. But I just didn't want to do the big shoulders just because Terry Moogler was ahead. Or, you know, and also a film, when you're doing a film, even on time, you're, it, it comes it, at the, the earliest, a year after fashion happens, like a year later. So you're all ready if you're copying that. That's why you're frustrated with TV, because you're on the nose. You could do, but, but look at the freedom you have. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thanks so much. Thank you.